Hello, Steve Fentress on behalf of the Strassenburg Planetarium at the Rochester Museum and Science Center again with a collection of launches, rocket launches. And the occasion for this is that coming up at the end of May 2020, according to the current schedule, astronauts Benkin and Hurley will go into space on a brand new American-made spacecraft. And that's the first time that has happened in almost 40 years. It'll be the SpaceX Dragon capsule on top of a SpaceX Falcon 9 rocket. And so we thought we'd look at some rocket launches of the past. They're pretty exciting. This is not going to be a collection of explosions and crashes. We know that rocket flight is inherently dangerous. The concentration of energy and the opposing forces of nature are far beyond our everyday experience. And people have died doing this. But we keep doing it because we've learned so much about our planet and the rest of the universe and ourselves. So we go back to the 1920s. Physics professor Robert Goddard, early experiments with liquid-fueled rockets. He's remembered as achieving the first successful liquid-fueled rocket flight in 1926. A rocket fueled by gasoline and liquid oxygen. videos from Clark University where Goddard was a professor. In 1944, the Army Signal Corps requested a high-altitude sounding rocket. The vehicle subsequently designed by the Jet Propulsion Laboratory was named the WAC Corporal. It was 12 inches in diameter and 194 inches in length. It was propelled by an acid aniline motor of 45 seconds duration. It was boosted out of a 100-foot launching tower by a tiny Tim aircraft rocket. Initial tests were made at White Sands Proving Ground in New Mexico in October 1945. The WAC rose more than 40 miles, setting an American record for that time. A very early American liquid-fueled rocket and the beginning of the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. But American engineers really began to learn about liquid-fueled rockets by experimenting with captured V-2s that were brought over from Germany after World War II. Flown in New Mexico. And instead of trying to deliver weapons, engineers were using these rockets to try to achieve maximum altitude. This was revolutionary in 1950, photographs of Earth from a height of 76 miles. Later, they had the idea of putting a WAC Corporal rocket on the nose of a V-2, making a two-stage rocket that could go even higher. And then the next step after that was for Americans to build a V-2-like rocket from scratch called the Viking, and we'll see a newsreel clip about that after the next V2 clip. In these early years, there were several groups doing research to develop useful rocket vehicles. Even as today, the information gained was freely exchanged, rapidly extending the base of our knowledge, developing new technology, creating experience and skills from which we might ultimately move to spaceflight. From one of these groups came the first true space flight in the world. On February 24, 1949, a WAC corporal placed a payload outside of the Earth's atmosphere. New Mexico, where we meet the U.S. Navy's giant Viking rocket, all set to make a trip to the stratosphere to record scientific data and take pictures of the Earth's surface. Final preparations are made before the five-ton missile is ready for an 1,800-mile-an-hour journey straight up. A forerunner, perhaps, of the first rocket to the moon. Late evening, Friday, January 31st, 1958, in a blockhouse at Canaveral. The countdown to Explorer 1. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five... Four, three, two, one. Fire command. Fire command. Fire command.
Meanwhile, a German-American team led by Werner von Braun had developed the Jupiter rocket. Jet Propulsion Laboratory had developed the Explorer 1 satellite to go on top of it. And here was first uh, the first American satellite in orbit, 1958. The missile is in flight, but it will take another hour and a half to know whether the satellite is in orbit. A relative of the Jupiter was the Redstone rocket, which was used to boost Alan Shepard in his Mercury capsule on a 15-minute flight to a height of 115 miles. All right, uh, lift off and the clock is started. Yes, sir, reading you loud and clear. The first American to go into space by going up vertically on a rocket. 1.2G, Kevin at 14 PSI, oxygen is go. Project Mercury, another step in man's search for knowledge. Freedom 7, another step toward man in space. And America was excited about this. Space. Man, that takes real teamwork. And here's a team of junior spacemen with an out-of-this-world breakfast that teams up V8 juice and Cheerios for flavor and energy. And now, here's a special out-of-this-world free offer. This moon rocket kit, both a toy and an exciting game. First, blast off. It separates in midair and lands two spacemen on a moon map. Next step put the Mercury capsule on a larger rocket powerful enough to boost it into orbit. These rockets were all originally developed to deliver nuclear warheads to the Soviet Union, and they were adapted for these peaceful purposes. In 1965, man in space made significant contributions to scientific knowledge. During the Gemini flights that year, astronauts... A slightly larger spacecraft that could carry two astronauts on a Titan intercontinental ballistic missile. Most spectacular has been the color photography from the Gemini spacecraft. Photographs like these have immense potential for the study of geology, water resources, glaciers, oceanography, meteorology, forestry, and even agriculture. And here's the in-space rendezvous of Gemini 6 and Gemini 7. And Gemini 6 almost didn't make it. Here's what happened the first time they tried to launch. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, one. Now we've got a shutdown. 
the engine shut down immediately, and Wally Shara, the commanding astronaut, did not pull the ejection seat handle. Decided to wait and see if things would settle down. They did and launched three days later. Another application of the Atlas rocket launching the robot Ranger 7 probe to the moon among many other probes and satellites. The mission of the Block 3 Ranger flights was to obtain television pictures of the small-scale topography in selected areas of the lunar surface. The Von Braun team in Alabama was working on clustering smaller rockets to make one really big one. The 10-vehicle Saturn I program was without precedent in the history of spaceflight. DCR, continuous light on. Fred DSI on lock tank. DCR, continuous light on. Eight count plus is 45. Lock tank pressure on. A program providing the foundation for the follow on advanced Saturn programs the uprated Saturn I and Saturn V. Retracted. Four, three, two, one, zero. Lock tank pressure on. And to represent more launches from the Apollo Moon program, let's see launches from the moon. And there was a slow period after Apollo, followed by the space shuttle program. T minus 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4. We've gone for main engine start. We have main engine start. The shuttle has cleared the tower. 135 space shuttle launches over 30 years with many wonderful achievements such as launching the Hubble Space Telescope, but also two of those launches resulted in destruction of the spacecraft and death of the crew. And in every flight it was always good news when those solid rocket boosters attached to the side had finished their work and detached. Standing by for SRB SEP confirmation. There we go. Roger on the SEP, Columbia. Next, let's check in on the Russians. Mark, uh, two minutes, 20 seconds. Confirm solid rocket booster SEP. It's a mild afternoon, a slight breeze over at the Baikonur Cosmodrome in Kazakhstan and sitting atop the Soyuz booster, 160 feet high, as the next crew is set to launch to the International Space Station. They are NASA's Chris Cassidy and Roscosmos cosmonauts Anatoly Ivanishin and Ivan Wagner. All right, and we're back at the launch pad now. You can see the gantry arms beginning to pull back that service structure, providing access to the rocket itself. One of the final tasks down there at the pad before we're ready for launch. 
launch. And there goes the second tower, so we are 15 seconds away from launch. We're going to see the boosters at the bottom light up, and as their thrust builds, it'll eventually overcome. Think you did. Made one. And lift off. Cassidy, even Eichen, and Wagner on their way to the International Space Station. Fifteen seconds into the flight, all parameters are nominal. We confirm on board, all parameters are nominal. Twenty seconds into launch, um, thrusters are working nominally. The crew is feeling fine. 30 seconds. All parameters for the vehicle are nominal. The crew is feeling fine. 40 seconds into flight. Thrusters are working nominally and the vehicle is nominal. Let's not forget smaller rockets, which can be pretty cool to watch, especially with up-to-date video and sound. Now, up above most of the Earth's atmosphere, this sound we'll hear will be sound that's communicated through the metal body of the rocket. Next, let's check in on China, the European Space Agency, and then India. Then Ariane 5 became Europe's heavy lift champion in use since 1996. With the 106 successful launches of Ariane 5, the Ariane program has been one of the most reliable launcher programs in history, proving Europe remains at the forefront with reliable technology. For Europe, innovation and creativity have been the keys to conquer its place in the worldwide launcher market. Seconds. 
10, the igniters have been lit. 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. And liftoff at dawn. The dawn of Orion and a new era of American space exploration. So the Orion spacecraft being tested here is what NASA proposes to use to send astronauts back to the moon. And for this test, it was on a Delta IV Heavy, at the time, America's most powerful rocket. One minute, 22 seconds in. Max Q, maximum dynamic pressure on the vehicle. Passing 124, Mach 1. Orion and Delta IV now transcending the speed of sound. One minute, 31 seconds in. Good engine control on the first stage. Coming up, one minute, 40 seconds. Velocity now 1,341 feet per second. One minute, 50 seconds in. But now we are in the era of competitive commercial space, so let's check in on Jeff Bezos's Blue Origin Company. And lift off. has cleared the tower. Separation. Apogee, 333,000 feet. Engine restart, we have thrust. 1,000 feet. Landing gear deploying. Touchdown. The idea here is that the most expensive part of a rocket is its engine, and if you can get that back, launching becomes much more economical. Now switching over to SpaceX and Elon Musk, an early test of his technology to land a rocket after its flight. team has given us the thumbs up for this that the spacecraft is ready to go uh, the range is also green and we're looking good uh, like I said earlier the weather is looking fantastic at the Cape for both launch and recovery and uh, here's the closest thing to the flight that's coming up crew dragon on top of a Falcon 9 rocket everything there but astronauts aboard the dress rehearsal just a year ago 10 9 8 Seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. Ignition, lift off. He 
vehicle is pitching downrange. Okay, no problem. Go ahead. Stage one throttle bucket. Power and telemetry nominal. And there it is, a collection of rocket launches to help us prepare for the Crew Demo for 2 those mission. just joining us, you are watching a live view of the Falcon 9 rocket as it ascends through the atmosphere carrying... Currently SpaceX scheduled for May 27th with astronauts Hurley and Benkin. Thank you for watching. The vehicle just passed through max Q, which is the point of maximum aerodynamic pressure on the vehicle.